best lab tests is the bucket that I put this one under. So there are a couple of questions at least. One question was, what four to five tests can we go to our PCP, our primary care physician, and request they run? Second question, what are the best lab tests as markers for longevity? Well, so the first one is, and I, I guess you could divide these into things that you really only need to have checked once, and then things that maybe you ought to be checking more than once. So a couple of things that everybody needs to have checked once is LP little a and APOE. So LP little a is a phenotype, but it effectively reflects a genotype, the LPA gene. And we're going to have an entire, probably two and a half hour discussion on LP little a. So I'm not going to say anything more about that, but suffice it to say, if you're listening to this and you don't know why I'm suggesting that you will, uh, but everybody needs to know their LP little a preferably their LP little a particle number, but LP little a mass is to a first order, a reasonable approximation. APOE of course is a gene and it exists mostly in three forms, the two, the three, and the four. There are others, but they're almost, I've never seen one. And because it's a gene, you get one from each parent. So therefore you can combine the two, the three, the four into six combinations, two, 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 three, two, four, three, 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 four, and four, four. And it is important to know those. In my opinion, though, I will certainly find myself arguing this point with physicians who say, why the hell would you ever want a patient to know that? There's nothing you can do about it. Because of course, this gene is probably the second strongest gene to predict Alzheimer's disease by magnitude, but the strongest by far by frequency. In other words, it's the one that matters more at the population level. I would agree with the logic of said physicians if I felt that there was nothing one could do to impact their chances of Alzheimer's disease. Obviously, I think that that's sort of nonsense. Uh, you and I and Dan co-authored a paper with Richard Isaacson at Cornell and a few of his colleagues on Alzheimer's prevention. So we're obviously in the camp that thinks Alzheimer's disease is at least somewhat, if not uh, significantly preventable, and therefore genotyping gives us great insight. Furthermore, APOE genotype gives enormous insight into cardiovascular risk, something that we probably ought to do a dedicated discussion around APOB, APOC, and APOE, just straight up APO talk. Yeah. I'd like to talk more about that now, but it's probably irrelevant. So you got to know your LP little a, you got to know your APOE. The other thing that, uh, again, I sort of think a lot about is if LP little a is the single most important lipoprotein, then LDLP or ApoB would be the next most important. So that's also something that I really think ought to be tracked. Boy, we're only allowed five, huh? Because I really, I guess I take for granted that we can just order lots of lab tests. Can you explain, sorry to back up, when you say LDLP or ApoB, I think some people might think like you can get either or test but they're more or less testing for the same thing. Can you explain yeah, so how ApoB relates to the LDL? So there's actually two ApoBs. There's ApoB48, which is an apolipoprotein that sits on something called the chylomicron, and then there's an ApoB100. And there is one and only one ApoB on each of the following molecules, VLDL, IDL, LDL, uh, and also LP little a. So by counting the number of ApoBs, you are counting the number of LDL particles. But because you measure ApoB in mass, it's measured as milligrams per deciliter of ApoB versus LDLP is measured in number or nanomole per liter. So the number will look very different. You know, if I said, tell me your ApoB and your LDLP, they will have different units and therefore not look anything alike, but they're proxies for the same thing. And that of course changes. It's influenced by four things. It's influenced by the amount of cholesterol you synthesize, the amount of cholesterol or sterol that you reabsorb, the amount of triglycerides you have to carry around, and your clearance of the particles, which is primarily driven by something called the LDL receptor or LDLR that sits on the liver. And because those four factors can all change in response to diet and drugs to different extents. Obviously triglyceride is by far the most sensitive to nutritional change, LDL receptor, probably the most genetically preset, but there are ways to tweak these things and certainly drugs tweak them. So we've got lots of ways to do that, but this is an important thing to know. I mean, the four lipoproteins that in approximately this order are important is LP, little a, LDLP, small LDLP, the subset 
of LDL that are below some cutoff, typically about 20 nanometers. And then we don't have a way to measure something called the VLDL remnant. So we use the poor man's proxy as I look at VLDL cholesterol, which you take the non-HDL cholesterol and subtract the LDL cholesterol, which you get off a standard lipid panel. That's especially helpful if at least the LDL is measured directly. But then, of course, you're often compromising and getting an indirect measure of the non-HDL. So, But that probably is a better proxy than taking triglyceride and dividing by five, which is the other poor man's way to get a VLDLC. And I like to see that number less than 15 milligrams per deciliter. Did you just find a utility for total cholesterol test? I have zero utility for total cholesterol. I think the only time a clinician should ever even pay attention to that number is if you have a patient that you are concerned has FH, familial hypercholesterolemia, and you're trying to get them approved for a PCSK9 inhibitor, then you will actually need to know their total cholesterol and their LDL cholesterol because you will use cutoffs, typically total cholesterol more than 350, LDL cholesterol more than 250 milligrams per deciliter is your cutoff. But I don't pay attention to LDL cholesterol. I don't pay attention to total cholesterol. And I pay minimal attention to HDL cholesterol. I'm more interested in the ratio of triglyceride to HDL cholesterol. But as we know now, increasing HDL cholesterol pharmacologically does not seem to have any benefit. I'm not even convinced increasing it dietarily does. I think it just goes along for the ride. In other words, I think that the things in a person's nutrition that increase their HDL are benefiting, but not because of the HDL. The HDL C is going up as a result of it. So I guess after all that rambling, I've basically said three things, which is LP little a, APOE, LDLP. I think everybody should encounter an oral glucose tolerance test and in particular one that uses insulin as well as glucose. So not uses insulin, but measures insulin. So you would take a fasting glucose insulin level. You would consume a standardized amount of glucose. Typically it's recommended to use 75 or 100 grams of liquid glucose called glucola. We do that for most of our patients. However, I am now on occasion using normal glucose to challenge them. So a hundred grams of glucose in the form of rice or potatoes, because I do think there's a subset of people who you're getting misleading responses from when you're using liquid glucose, which is actually quite unnatural. You don't consume glucola regularly? I mean, I I didn't look in your fridge, but... (laughs) You know, I've got six bottles back there, (laughs) but I save that only for the special occasions, like along with the other alcohols that I like. (laughs) Now, the shit is horrible taken enough of those glucose tolerance tests. In fact, I'll probably never do one again. I'll probably from now on only do them with, you know, rice or potatoes or something like that. Is that complicated to to do the OGTT with insulin or is that something that most Well, you know, it's interesting cuz I do see some stuff on Twitter about, "Hey, why do I need to go to my doctor to do that? I can just do it at home." And you can do it at home with the glucose response because, you know, we have portable glucometers. Uh, But insulin can't be measured easily. It's not a test you can do at home. So it needs a laboratory. And if you're not seeing the insulin, you're not knowing the answer. So if you fail a glucose tolerance test on glucose levels, well, then you've really failed. And what do I define as a failure? I want to see fasting glucose, typically below 90. I want to see one hour postprandial below 120 to 130, depending on the amount of muscle mass the person has. And I want to see two hour glucose below 100. In other words, I have much more rigorous standards than the laboratory form would show. And you can be there and still have hyperinsulinemia, especially postprandially. Usually a person there will not have hyperinsulinemia when fasting. But it's not uncommon. In fact, I'm seeing a patient tomorrow. I was just looking over his labs today. And he's great fasting glucose. Fasting insulin is below 6, which is my target. At one hour, his glucose is like 114. Great. But his insulin's 56. And at two hours, he's fine, below 100, and his insulin's below 20. So what is the implication there of this guy who's got basically only one 
X on his record, which is his one hour insulin is 56. Well, that's, you know, as Joseph Kraft describes that, that's diabetes in situ. So that is postprandial hyperinsulinemia, which is a harbinger to insulin resistance. And look, he might be five years away from being insulin resistant, but that's exactly the time I'd like to be able to to intervene. And so uh, this is one of those tests where, yeah, it would be a lot easier if we could just do it at home with our glucometers, but I think it is worth the hassle of doing it and getting the, the actual insulin data. Boy, what else do I like to see? I've already got pretty heavy focus on the cardiovascular, so I'll try to avoid any other cardiovascular stuff, although I, obviously a C-reactive protein, a homocysteine, or an oxidized LDL, or an oxidized phospholipid are really, really helpful. But I think since we're only going for five, probably ALT, which I alluded to earlier. I think today we're just seeing so much fatty liver disease. And uh, again, the labs, which are basically showing you plus or minus two standard deviations, have just seen an upward drift of this over decades. And I was actually just talking about this with Rob Lustig a while ago on another podcast, which I don't know what order we're going to release these things, but that'll either have already come out or be coming out. But we were talking about how we both sort of share this point of view, which is we just kind of ignore the laboratory references on, on many of these things. And, and, and for ALT, on our lab, uh, up to 42 is normal. If I see a patient walking around at 38, I'm highly alarmed. You made a great point about that too. I snuck in a listen to that podcast. You're sneaking in listens yeah. on the podcast already? <laughs> Membership has its benefits. The ALT, for, so 42, I think you said, is that's considered normal today, but... 30, 40, 50 years ago, that was not considered normal. That's right. Why? Uh, I mean, I think Rob would argue, and I would agree, that as we've seen an increase in fructose consumption, it's driving a greater and greater prevalence of NAFLD. This was a condition that wasn't even recognized 20 years ago. If the last data I looked at are any indication, by 2025, the combination of the success we've had treating hep C and the rampant rise in NAFLD means by 2025, this will be the NASH, which is the sort of NASH, NAFLD to NASH to cirrhosis. That pathway will be the leading indication for liver transplant in the United States, which is sort of hard to contemplate when, when you realize that in two, the year 2000, less than 1% of liver transplants were for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And I think one of the things about the lab, the reference ranges, is that they're based on the population mean. So 30 to 40 years ago, an ALT, a normal ALT would be actually considered lower than 42. Oh, yeah. But because the, the the national average is higher, when you look at a lab test, you're within range. You may be at 42 and you're looking at it and saying, I want it below 20. Yeah. The other thing I've seen enormous drift on, even just in my very, very brief career on a relative basis is estradiol levels in men. I mean, I've seen two upward shifts in the range at the same lab over eight years. So men are becoming more and more and more estrogenized. And there are lots of reasons for that, which we'll probably talk about on another podcast. So those are my, I can't even remember. I lost track how many labs I recommended, but I think uh, the spirit of the question was if, you, if you're going to be a minimalist, what are you going to do? You got five in there, definitely.